Yes, uh, hello, good evening, ladies and gentlemen, dear colleagues. Um, I would like to very warmly welcome you at our today's session of the Ukrainian Studies Online Colloquium that is organized jointly by Prisma Ukraina Research Network Eastern Europe in Berlin and the Chair of Entangled History of Ukraine at the Viadrina European University in Frankfurt Oder. And we are very pleased today to welcome uh, Marina Snezinska and Hanna Hnetkova, um, whom I will uh, introduce now briefly to you. Um, thank you very much uh, for showing your readiness to share your work with us. Maria, uh, Marina Snezinska holds a master degree from the Kiev Mohila Academy and is now a PhD student there working on in the field of literary sciences. Um, she has uh, published extensively on various topics of Ukrainian literature. Um, and today she will uh, hold a talk on the influence of the Parnassian movement in French literature on the neoclassicism in Ukrainian literature. And Hanna Hnetkova, she uh, likewise holds a master degree in philology from the Kiev Mohila Academy. And she now studies at the um, University of Vienna in Austria. And she has really an impressive list of uh, books translated from English and German into Ukrainian and actually vice versa, which is very rare that uh, people uh, translate in both directions, but she has also um, translated numerous um, articles uh, and also published uh, a lot of um, articles um, and so on herself. So uh, thank you very much for um, finding time to join us today. And I would now like to ask Marina um, to start her, con uh, her um, talk. But before that, um, I would uh, like to remind you that after uh, Marina's talk and Hannah's comment, um, the audience has the possibility to ask questions. So during your talk, uh, please think about possible uh, questions, comments, and so on for Marina and Hannah. Uh, thank you very much from my side, and Marina, the floor is yours. Thank you, Lucas. Mm, good evening, dear colleagues. I'll share my screen for you. Yeah, do you see it? Okay, mm, I'm very honored uh, to present my research about the uh, about comparing the phenomena uh, of Kiev neoclassicism and French uh, Parnassism. It's only one um, aspect of my PhD uh, research, uh, the topic of which is um, the reception of French culture in the works by Kiev neoclassics. In this uh, presentation, I want to give you some uh, contextual view about uh, the origins of Ukrainian uh, neoclassicism and French uh, Parnassism. Uh, secondly, we will consider uh, the work of uh, neoclassics and uh, Parnassians uh, in the plane of historical realities in which these trends were formed. Um, also, we will speak uh, about their relations with uh, modernity, antiquity, romanticism. Um, and finally, uh, we will outline the main points of disagreement uh, between these two literature, literature phenomena. Uh, the purpose of this study is uh, to analyze uh, similar and different features between uh, Kiev neoclassics and French uh, Parnassians, and it will help us to find out the uniqueness of Ukrainian version of the neoclassicism. Uh, in Ukraine, uh, the 1920s uh, were a 
a period of um, unprecedented literary rise. During this time, many uh, different literary groups appeared. Um, they were um, connected uh, with the avant-garde style and also with the proletarian style. Um, a group of neoclassicists uh, was uh, formed at uh, this time and uh, was very different from the uh, other uh, Ukrainian groups. Uh, five poets, uh, which you can see in the slide, um, was the foundation of this group. Uh, they were uh, Mykola Zarov, Maxim, uh, Mykola Zarov, Maxim Rysky, Pavlo Filipovich, Yuri, uh, Mikhail Dreichmara, and Yuri Klen. Uh, also um, worth mentioning um, Viktor Petrov Demantovich, who was the only one uh, prose writer in this group. Uh, this Writers were the first um, well-qualified uh, philologist in Ukrainian literature, uh, and it's uh, visible in their works, uh, which are um, uh, full of uh, intertextual uh, material, and uh, also uh, there is a great um, uh, philosophism in their uh, works. Uh, these uh, people were in intellectual opposition uh, to Soviet ideology and they paid their lives for it. Uh, Mikola Zarov and Pavlo Filipovich were murdered in uh, 1937, Mikhail Dreichmar died in, uh, died in 1939 uh, in Kolyma, and um, Yuri Klan uh, immigrated to uh, Europe in 1931. Uh, Maxim Rysky was forced to convert to social realism, but uh, in the level of uh, uh, ideology, he uh, remained the uh, representative of neoclassicism. Uh, the neoclassicist uh, viewpoint was focused on ancient classics. They appeared to uh, antiquity directly and uh, through other cultural eras. Uh, for uh, this Kyiv group, the French Parnassus um, was one of the chains uh, which uh, connect antiquity with uh, modernity and uh, uh, introduce antiquity into modernity. Uh, literary movement uh, of the classical uh, direction, uh, which regularly uh, appeared in the European literature, uh, are uh, integrated with the uh, literary uh, movements uh, that preceded them. Uh, thus, uh, classicism is uh, always um, upgraded and um, doesn't lose its relevance. Volodymyr Dershavin um, is a, a literary criticist, a critic who uh, has made one of the completest uh, comparative analysis uh, of Kiev neoclassicism and French Parnassism. Um, calls uh, the Parnassism um, a virtuoso refined variety of pan-European neoclassicism. Uh, in Ukraine, it's a virtuoso raffinovana vidmina vseyevropejsku neoclassicism, and uh, I like this definition so much. Uh, therefore, uh, for Kiev neoclassicism, the reception of French uh, Parnassus po um, poetical achievements was a necessary step uh, for developing um, the classicism into their literature. Uh, the period of existing the group of Parnassus is relatively short, from uh, 1860s to um, 1880s. Uh, this diverse uh, poetic community uh, conditionally uh, included authors uh, who, are, who were published in the um, journal um, The Contemporary uh, Parnassus. Uh, there were approximately 100 of authors who were published um, in three volumes of this journal. But there are only two poets who are um, really uh, interesting for us in this uh, context uh, and um, in their creativity uh, fully and consistently uh, were implemented such uh, principles as um, impersonality, the elimination of disturbing elements of individual feelings in the treatment of external things and the supreme, supreme importance of form. Uh, these authors are Charles de Condely and José María de Aradia. Uh, Teofil Gautier also um, is uh, important uh, in this context uh, because uh, he is the creator of the principle, um, very um, famous Parnassian principle, uh, the art for art's sake. Uh, in them, uh, contemporary Parnassus were also published uh, the works by um, Stefan Mollermeyer, Paul Berlin, and uh, uh, in the first volume, even Charles Baudelaire um, published 16 his poems. Uh, the work 
of Parnassus was often negatively um, perceived during their times and um, even uh, in the end of the last century, uh, this phenomenon was considered in some works uh, only as a chronological crack between uh, romanticism and symbolism. Uh, but cave poets uh, in 1920s uh, not only appreciated uh, the works um, of Parnassus, uh, but also tried to introduce them into Ukrainian, uh, to Ukrainian readers. Uh, they made a lot of translations from these authors, uh, not only um, of Kondelil, uh, Aradia, and uh, Gautier, but also uh, for Sully Prudhomme, Charles Croft, uh, Theodore de Bonneville, and Leon Gierks. Uh, the name of the um, group Parnassus and the name of the some uh, members of this group, um, especially Le Condé and Aradia, uh, have appeared a few times in the uh, poetry of uh, neoclassics. For example, the sonnet uh, Prodoma by Mikolazarov um, includes their names and uh, it shows um, them as the aesthetical uh, orienti um, orienteers for uh, Kiev neoclassics. Uh, uh, what was thinking Mikolazarov about uh, these poets? Uh, also, um, there is an interesting uh, text um, as Neoclassical March, um, where this um, idea um, is. Um, 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 sh is shown like irony or even uh, like a self irony. Um, nad ukrainskim alanami duh neoklasiki buja i razu razčiljuju z nami kondelil eredija. Um, this um, um, a neoclassical march uh, was co-created by Mikola Zarov, Pavlo Filipovich, Mikhailo Dreykhmar, and Maxim Reisky, and uh, was uh, presented in Maxim Reisky's birthday um, in 1926. Uh, Maxim Reisky called um, his uh, friends neoclassics um, comrades of Parnassus. Um, the five from Parnassus were the um, uh, headline of the article uh, published in, in the Bolshevik newspaper. Um, and in this uh, article, um, his author uh, accuses uh, neoclassics of escaping from reality. Uh, the definition uh, of Kiev neoclassicism as the Ukrainian Parnassism uh, became, became entrenched uh, in uh, literature studies in uh, 1983 after article by Igor Kachurovsky, which was called um, Ukrainian uh, Parnassus. Uh, comparing the phenomena of Kiev neoclassicism and uh, French uh, Parnassism, we can avoid um, biographical parallels. Both uh, groups had their leader, aesthetical ideologist. For Kiev neoclassics, it was Mikola Zarov. For Parnassians, the central figure was Le Condé, the author of the collection Ancient Poems, um, which was published in uh, 1852. Uh, and uh, which gave rise to this great political movement. Um, both uh, neoclassics and uh, Parnassians existed in the, their nature, uh, national literature as full-fledged aesthetic uh, projects uh, with their vision of literature, uh, but uh, they didn't consisted, um, consider themselves as schools. There were aesthetic communities uh, not created artificially. They were formed according to the uh, laws of art and due to some um, values of their members. Uh, Viktor Petrov emphasizes that neoclassics were not a literary group, but a company of friends. There was no school. There were inner amicability and personal friendship. Maxim Reisky emphasized that the aesthetic platform that united uh, them uh, was the love to the world, to the strict form uh, of great heritage of world literature. These statements are very similar to the um, statements about, uh, of Katum Mendes' description of Parnassian as a phenomenon. There was never, I repeat, neither in intention nor if in fact a Parnassian school. We had nothing in common except for a youth hope, a hatred for <clears throat> poetic untidiness, and then a uh, chimera of perfect beauty. Nowadays, we can argue uh, Viktor Petrov's position, uh, and we can suggest that there was a school, um, there was a literary group, 
Um, but Ukraine in 1920 was, was not an appropriate place um, for neoclassics to manifest themselves. Um, but maybe they manifested themselves through translations. Um, especially it uh, concerns uh, translation from um, Parnassian poetry, uh, which was um, um, on the level of idea very close to them. For example, Mikhail Dreichmar uh, translated the poem Lach by uh, Teofil Gautier, uh, in which their Parnassian poetic is um, embodied. Um, this uh, poem by uh, Teofil Gautier was uh, kind of um, manifesto um, of um, Parnassism, uh, like Lach um, Poetic um, or Poetic of Aristotle and, um, uh, and other poetics of, um, of the classicism uh, literature. Uh, they uh, liked uh, such, um, such poetics, uh, uh, though, um, where they uh, included some poetical rules uh, so much. Uh, so we can see here in this poem some um, uh, great things, um, significant things about um, neoclassical literature, um, especially uh, it's uh, connected with craft, takut virtim krasnishi, chim zyate material trudnishi, virsh marmur chimetal, Rizbe karbu i horlivu i vtisni sni krihki stimri na divu u grudi kremizni. So they considered uh, literature such a craft work. Um, paradoxically, the poetry of strict form of uh, laconic expression of a strict work, uh, a poetry of classical orientation is uh, connected with uh, uh, revolution events. It applies both to Parnassian and French poets. Uh, Viktor Petrov uh, draws attention to it. It was the neoclassicist uh, who acted as representatives of classical tendencies in Ukrainian poetry during the revolution. Uh, meanwhile, as usual, the most consonant with uh, revolution was uh, considered to be uh, a disjoint, disorganized and chaotic impressionist style. Uh, the Parnassian group uh, appeared after the disappointment of the French Revolution uh, of uh, 1848. Uh, the French who uh, received a universal uh, suffrage elected uh, Napoleon III Bonaparte as the president of newly created um, republic, um, but he returned the country to absolutism. Uh, in this, uh, this is a reason for Parnassian's despondency in politics and in social order. Um, especially it concerns um, Charles Le Condelier, who was the active participant of this revolution. Uh, for the um, Parnassians, the uh, consequences of disappointment with the revolution were uh, apoliticism, escapism, and to some extent, pessimism. Mm, the years of formation of the uh, neoclassical group in Ukraine uh, felt on turbulent years of um, revolution, a changing of government, uh, the emergency of new Ukrainian statehood and its loss. Having examples uh, of uh, world uh, revolutions, including above mentioned um, revolution in France, Ukrainian writers had no um, illusion about the possibility of changing of power by force. Mm, therefore, they became uh, an intellectual opposition to the uh, revolution enthusiastics. Mm, antiquity, uh, both Greece and Rome, uh, is a foundation of European literature. Uh, also, it's uh, it extremely valuable to the um, classicist literature styles. Uh, Le Condelier translated Iliad, uh, one of the greatest uh, Greece uh, antiquity texts. Uh, Mikola Zaro uh, was translating in it a Roman ancient poem. Unfortunately, today um, we have only some fragments of these translations, um, translation by Mikola Zaro, uh, because Mikola Zaro uh, was working on it uh, and even finished it uh, being um, uh, exiled in Solovki. Um, and we can only guess what happened with this uh, translation, uh, with this Ukrainian version of in it. Uh, after Mikola Zarov murder. Mm, but the choice of Kondeli um, in a favor to ancient Greece and the choice um, of Mikola Zarov to ancient Rome text um, 
are very um, revealing. Uh, Zarov's main interest in translation uh, was uh, Latin literature antiquity, the fir first classicism. Uh, at this time, uh, for um, Le Congeli, uh, the classics itself, the literature of Greece uh, was the most important. Um, um, Parnassians uh, were interested in this literature and uh, in the preface, uh, preface to the first edition um, of ancient poems, Le um, de Lille uh, negatively uh, evaluates a literature uh, after Greece. Uh, in his poem, he breaks the um, rule uh, to give uh, Greek uh, mythological heroes Latin equivalents of names. Uh, he uses um, used original Greek names, uh, for example, uh, Zeus for Jupiter um, and uh, some uh, other words, uh, which uh, connects uh, this literature style, uh, this movement, uh, with the uh, neoclassicism, uh, French neoclassicism of uh, 18th century. The works uh, of Parnassians are full uh, of a nostalgia for beautiful past times, and uh, modern times could not satisfy them at all. Uh, some marks uh, of rejection of the reality we can see uh, even in the uh, early work, works by uh, Théophile Gautier. Uh, in the preface, uh, the novel uh, Mademoiselle de Maupin, uh, he expresses some considerable ideas in the context of future Parnassism. Uh, he makes a strong dis um, distinction between beautiful and um, useful. Um, and uh, he makes this in very provocative manner. Um, this uh, position will later become um, a principle of uh, art for art's sake. Uh, he um, writes, there is nothing beautiful except uh, that uh, which is not useful. Everything useful is ugly. Uh, second interesting to feel uh, Gautier idea is um, the impossibility of the progress. Mm, and uh, he mentioned it in such way. Uh, centuries ago, we had Raphael, we had Michelangelo, and now we have Monsieur Paul de La Roche, and all because we are progressing. Uh, such ideas we also can find uh, lately uh, in Parnassian times uh, in Le Condelis work. Um, I hate my time, he writes. Uh, Yuri Shevelyov actually said that uh, Kiev neoclassics were um, thinking like pessimists but acting like optimists. They didn't have such radical and uh, unshakable rejection of reality. <clears throat> they were radical only uh, in the uh, pursuit of high quality Ukrainian literature. Um, Kiev neoclassicists uh, were hiding from reality in the past times, but even their past times um, very often were connected with Ukraine, uh, for example, Ukrainian uh, Baroque or uh, Kievan Rus. Um, they focused their efforts on raising the awareness of Ukrainian uh, writers and readers, and it anchored them in the present times. Um, Maxim Rilski expresses this position in the um, sonnet, um, which calls Epochu de Bdusha i Vitpochit. In this uh, poem, <clears throat> he uh, thinks about um, uh, escaping. Uh, of some other um, time periods, but uh, in the end, uh, he think that um, uh, uh, Also, for Kiev Neoclassics, its uh, question is controversial because um, Mikhail Zarov sometimes uh, really was escaping uh, in the uh, different times, but sometimes in his works uh, we see um, um, we see very uh, modern topics. Uh, even uh, when the um, heroes of these topics uh, are um, from the past times. A uh, fundamental task um, of both uh, Parnassians and Kiev neoclassics uh, was uh, to overcome uh, Romanticism. Uh, Parnassians had a, a complicated relations with Romanticism. Uh, romanticism and uh, Parnassism are closely aligned in some levels and uh, yet significantly opposed to each other. <clears throat> Parnassians didn't accept them. Um, excessive subjectivity of uh, romanticism and the concept of creativity uh, as the metaphysical um, process. 
um, but they were um, so connected with romanticism. For example, Theophile Gautier, um, uh, who, as we know, created Art for Art's Sake, uh, joined um, uh, Parnassian group and um, uh, was one of the creators of Parnassian group. Um, but uh, before he was a romantic writer and uh, had a lot of novels and uh, plays. Um, and even then, uh, exotism uh, of Condeli poems um, is romantic. Uh, in uh, his work, there are a lot of Indian motifs, uh, exotism concerned um, landscapes, concerned fauna. And this uh, specific feature of uh, Parnassians, um, which was connected with Romanticism, uh, attracted the most um, to Yuri Kuan. Uh, many uh, topics of his poems uh, include um, journeys and uh, exotic lands. Uh, this feature uh, is possible to um, explain according to his bi uh, biography. Uh, the theme of the journey was uh, very personal and painful for Yuri Kuan. Uh, during the um, First uh, World War, he was deported to Russia and uh, in 1931, um, his um, experience of immigration to Europe began. Mikola Zarov translated Aradia's poem, um, Lea Conquerant, uh, and published it in uh, 1921. After 22 years, Yuri Klan uh, used uh, two lines from this poem, and uh, made them um, as an epigraph uh, to his collection uh, of poems Caravelli. Uh, it's how this um, interaction uh, between translations and uh, uh, between their real works um, was connected. Um, in the context of exotic motifs, we also can speak about Maxim Ryski, um, but in this case, uh, there is no direct connection um, with Parnassians. Uh, for them, Frenchman Le Conbelli, um, India was exotic, but for them, Maxim Brisky, who lived in the Soviet Kiev and couldn't get um, uh, to Europe, um, France was exotic itself. Uh, there are a lot of um, French references in his collection, Blue Distance. For example, Atam des de Mansard, the Poet is on Paris, and there are a lot of uh, these um, things connected with France. Uh, and uh, even the name of the um, collection uh, Signe de Vicini is also connected with uh, with France <clears throat> and uh, here in the uh, title of the in the cover of the book uh, we see the Notre Dame de Paris um, depicted uh, and lately Maxim Rizky uh, himself called it uh, exotic and uh, uh, it, uh, it's about his way, um, his earlier poems, um, Signe de Lucin, I think. Uh, like the Parnassians, Ukrainian neoclassicism also, um, um, sorry, um, there are two poems where neoclassicism, uh, neoclassics uh, mentioned uh, Parnassus. Uh, it's the poem by M. Kolazarov, uh, which is dedicated to Pavel Filipovich. Um, this poem is also um, self-ironic. Um, the irony is usually um, used to um, emphasize the most characteristic feature. Um, and uh, Mikola Zarov was aware that uh, they are the most, um, the most uh, bright feature was a connection with uh, Parnassus. Uh, Ідете доріжкою Максима Івасі і стежите парнаську течію. Uh, he talks about Pavel Filipovich and Maxim. In this context, it's Maxim Brilsky because in um, uh, other edition of this poem, uh, he writes, Ідете um, стежками Рильського і Лесі. Uh, and another poem is um, without irony. Um, it's only reflection. It's reflection by um, Maxim Brilsky. Um, this poet came to neoclassicism um, 
through the symbolism and the influences um, of Charles Baudelaire. Uh, and uh, the um, topic of um, Parnassism, uh, the idea of Parnassism <clears throat> was very um, often reflected by them, but um, for me it was not accepted uh, such, it was accepted um, by Mikolazarov. Um, one of the features of the um, uh, poetry of uh, Parnassus is impassiveness. Uh, Lezam Pasabel was the first name uh, of the Parnassian group, uh, which their critics gave them. Uh, and uh, Maxim Rysky um, uh, thinks about the emotion and uh, feelings which are hidden uh, behind a strict form and well-chosen uh, vocabulary in them. Uh, Parnassian poetry. <clears throat> uh, he also disagreed uh, with the uh, reception of Parnassian poetry as the cold poetry. Uh, and the example of Fit uh, is um, in his analysis um, of Mikhail Dreichmara poetry. Холодна радія, але в його жилах текла й бушувала кров смуглявих конкістадорів. So, uh, even if the uh, poet is really feel uh, pain, um, pain, even if he uh, is really emotioned, um, he. Um, he must um, make uh, the uh, well quality uh, poetry despite of his real feelings. Um, Mikola Zero was uh, influenced by uh, Jose Maria uh, Aradia the most. Um, the Aradia was, uh, Aradia was um, the youngest, I think, um, Parnassian poet, uh, and in uh, his works, um, there are um, a lot of sonnets, and uh, it's a mode exclusively uh, consists of sonnets. Uh, he fully shared the Condé's uh, ideas about form and uh, uh, impersonality in art. Um, Mikola Zerov made a great effort to uh, translate uh, these poems uh, into Ukrainian and to show it uh, to Ukrainian reader. Uh, he translated about 10 of uh, radio sonnets. Um, Kola Zarev accepted Aradia idea uh, of literary form, uh, which is connected with the ancient concept. Uh, strict form is an obstacle only to confusion and literary uh, negligence, but not to creativity. Um, now we come to the conclusion. Uh, there are um, many reasons to look uh, for the origins of Ukrainian neoclassicism uh, in the uh, reception of the French uh, Parnassism. Uh, with this movement, the Kiev group uh, has more in common than uh, in um, uh, another uh, literary styles uh, and another um, phenomena of the world literature. Um, the difference between uh, Parnassus uh, and uh, Ukrainian classicism um, largely relates to historical conditions uh, in which uh, they were formed. Uh, the group Parnassus uh, continued a classical trend in literature where the classicism has already uh, a long story. Um, Ukrainian writers uh, implemented this style into literature where um, classicism in a strict um, sense didn't exist before. Uh, searching for balance between uh, emotions and called uh, contemplation of inner processes between uh, a politicism and uh, cultural work for the future differs a uh, Ukrainian uh, poetry group from their uh, French uh, uh, predecessors uh, who tended uh, romantic radicalism in aesthetic choice. Kiev poets were more focused on the national aspect in literature uh, than uh, Parnassians. Uh, even in es escaping from this uh, reality, uh, they referred to Ukrainian past, uh, which anchored them in the present. Um, the meaning uh, of the words um, Parnassus and uh, Parnassianism have already lost their uh, direct uh, semantic connection with the phenomena of French literature. Uh, their perception of these uh, words uh, jumped uh, through the 30 years of French literature and returned to its origins, to the mythological mountain, the home of beautiful names and pattern of art, especially classical and neoclassical art, Apollo. Uh, in the context of Ukrainian literary criticism, um, 
Parnassians uh, means the aesthetic reflection on the text, the rejection of political urgency, philosophism, intellectualism, poetry, um, the uh, sovereignty of art, elitism, uh, the purpose art for the select uh, circle of <clears throat> uh, connoisseurs, uh, not to the crowd, and the appeal to the classical past. Uh, Ukrainian neoclassicism and French uh, Parnassism are um, have a lot uh, have much in common, but they are different. Uh, the realization of classicism in uh, post-revolutionary uh, France and in Soviet Ukraine uh, couldn't be the same. Uh, the model of French uh, Parnassism helped give uh, literary group to develop rapidly and achieve um, unprecedented prosperity of Ukrainian literature. Uh, that's all. Thank you for your attention. I'm waiting for your comments and questions. Yeah, um, thank you, Marina, for your really very much, a very interesting talk. And now I would like to invite Hanna Netkova to comment on your talk. Thank you. First of all, thank you. Uh, yeah. We hear you, we hear you great. Okay, good. Thank you for the invitation to today's discussion. And uh, I'd like to thank Marina Snizinska for her speech on the Ukrainian Panas. Um, Marina Snizinska's paper contributes to the intertextual analysis of Ukrainian neoclassicist poetry. To my mind, uh, the main importance of this article lies in the reactualization of French Ukrainian poetical dialogue. The poetry of the Kiev neoclassicists uh, is rich in marked intertextual references to Oriental motifs and Arabic melodies, still the first and most prevalent association with the neoclassicists remains the literature of ancient Greece and Rome. Uh, which as talented translators uh, and creators of the new Ukrainian classics they were familiar with in the, in the original. Uh, what is often neglected uh, is their secondary source and their contemporary dialogue with French uh, Panassian po poets, uh, mostly with uh, Charles Le Con de Lille and uh, José Marie de Heredia. Uh, a comparison of the aesthetic dominance of the work of both groups is complicated by the, by the fact that neither group called itself a school and neither of them had a definite manifesto. Uh, in the case of the Ukrainian neoclassicists, uh, instead of a manifesto, the group composed, uh, as you have seen, a collective mock poem called the Neoclassical March. Um, among the aesthetic gu guidelines that unite them, one can single out the orientation on art for art's sake, as well as the attention to form, uh, to brevity and uh, precision in words. And as for the attention to form, however, we cannot say with certainty that it came to them through the influence of the French. Because as we know from the, from the memoirs of uh, Viktor Petrov Domantovich, the Ukrainian poets could learn the orientation on not on what, but on how, not on content, but on form from the lectures of Professor Volodymyr Peretz uh, of Kiev University. Also, as Vera Heva notes in her article, formalism uh, in the concepts of the Kiev neoclassicists Mykola Zarov, uh, Viktor Petrov, and Pavlo Filipovich certainly knew and cited Russian formalists in articles and letters, uh, although they didn't always agree with them. Uh, formalist criticism was written by the authors of the literary and critical almanac and Musaget at the time. These were two uh, magazines uh, existing at that time. Vira Heyva names Viktor Petrov, uh, Grigory Maifet, uh, Volodymyr Dejavin, and Dmitry Chizhevsky as followers of some of the postulates of formalism. And also from the notebooks of Viktor Petrov, it is clear that, we are, that he was also interested in the works of German formalists, uh, such as uh, Wölflin, uh, Walzel, Föhrige, uh, uh, Zimmel, or Schukin. Uh, in the part of uh, Marina's article where she moves from the unifying principles to the differences, 
there was one statement that on first reading I objected to. But on the second reading, it convinced me, uh, namely the article stated that the poetry of the Kiev neoclassicists uh, is not characterized by a radical rejection of reality and uh, disillusionment with authority. Upon reading, I realized that Marina Snirinska was saying that the neoclassicists uh, neo were pessimistic about the possibilities for the development of literature under the new Soviet regime from the start and therefore were not disillusioned with it. Uh, unlike the French Panassians, uh, whose poetry is colored by a nostalgia for a, long past, a lost past, uh, neoclassicists, I quote, thought like pessimists, by, but acted like optimists and were engaged in reality. It seems to me that the article could have had a productive follow-up if it had used a close reading and comparison of the translations produced by the neoclassicists uh, from French, in addition to the intertextual method we've seen, perhaps by paying attention to the neoclassicists' choice of words and texts for translation, one could make some additional conclusions about what kind of poetic principles the neoclassicists tried to preserve in translation and try to transfer to Ukrainian literature. Uh, choice of texts is of, often revealing, as Marina Snizhinska correctly mentions, the fact that Mykola Zerov uh, works specifically on the translation of the Enid uh, is evidence of the neoclassicist's polemic with Ivan Kudlerevsky's burlesque um, Ukrainian version of Enid and of attempts to revise and rewrite the Ukrainian literary uh, canon. It is thanks to their revision that uh, European motifs uh, in the works of Lesia Ukrainka and Ivan Frankov, for instance, were brought into the spotlight. Unfortunately, not all the Ukrainian translations of the French Panassian poets have survived. Uh, what was planned to be included in the anthology of French poetry, um, which uh, never came out and was lost in the archives of the NKVD, uh, which is uh, the Interior Ministry of the Soviet Union. You can read in detail in the article by Grigory Kochur, uh, Stages of Development. I have this book <laughs> here with me, French Literature in Ukrainian Translations. Uh, it was while working on this anthology that Kochur uh, became acquainted uh, with the neoclassicists. I will quote my translation of an excerpt uh, from his article. Uh, as early as um, 1921, a group of Kiev poets uh, began working on an anthology of 20th century French poetry. The work was not completed. In 1924, only one book by uh, Kalinovich, The Paths of Modern French Poetry, which was supposed to be an introductory article to the anthology, was published separately. This idea was later expanded in 1928, uh, 1930, under uh, the editorship of uh, Savchenko and uh, Mykola Zerov, who were preparing an anthology not of modern, but of the newest French poetry from the so-called romantic decadence uh, to our days. Uh, the book didn't come out, though it was uh, really ready for printing. It was supposed to be a very interesting collection. Many brilliant translations by Dreich Mara were made for it. Uh, Zerov, widely known as the translation, uh, translator of the classical uh, sonnets of Erdia, uh, appeared therein uh, not only with Parnassian translations, uh, but also in a somewhat unexpected role. Uh, next to the classical uh, Le Conte de Lille, uh, he had a cheeky song by Charles Crow about a smoked hearing. Uh, it appears on, uh, also in Tereshansky's anthology. Uh, he had a wonderful translation on, of uh, Werhard, and he translated uh, Duhamel in free verse. Makola Rilski completed, uh, competed with Zerov uh, in rendering the sonnets of Eridia, translating uh, Verlaine and Renier. French poet uh, Mazad, uh, one of the best translation, uh, translators of Shakespeare, heard about neoclassical motifs in Ukrainian poetry, became acquainted with Rilski's poems and translated several of them. Rilski responded to it. Uh, Mazat's uh, poems appeared in the anthology. 
end of quote. Um, it is really a pity that this anthology was lost. Uh, some of these translations are still available in the magazines and compilations of the anthology participants, Drachmara, Filipovich, Rilski, Zerov, and Bubinski. Marina referred to some of them uh, also in her article. Uh, since this article, as far as I know, is part of her dissertation, perhaps it would make sense to compile all the available translations by both neoclassicists and other Ukrainian poets and translation, uh, translators into a separate appendix to the paper. Uh, the paper I'm commenting on already contains a comparison of the poems and essays of French and Ukrainian Parnassians. So my main wish or advice would be to uh, also add a comparison of the French original with the Ukrainian translations. Um, and now, unless Marina wants to respond to my comment, I'd like to give the word to the event moderator and to the listeners who may have questions piled up. Thank you for your attention. Oh, may I respond? Yeah. Yeah, of course. Yes, yeah, sure, sure, sure. Uh, uh, thank you, Hanna, for your um, great comment. Um, um, Yes, we can deny that uh, Kiev neoclassicists were inspired not only um, French Parnassians, but also um, somehow uh, by um, Russian formalists. Uh, and um, it's uh, uh, sometimes um, we can see in uh, their um, articles. Um, it's an important comment. Um, and about uh, the translations, um, yes, I'm planning uh, to work with them lately. Um, and uh, I have um, a lot of ideas about these uh, translations. Um, the interesting fact that um, Nikola Zarov included the translations from um, a radio to his uh, commander uh, as the um, um, the equal rights um, works um, uh, such as uh, his uh, original works uh, with his original works um, it's a, a sign that uh, he really appreciated this uh, poetry and uh, mm, uh, for him uh, translating and uh, writing original poems was um, the some valuable um, work um, so thank you for your comment Yeah, uh, thank you, Hannah, for your comment, and thank you, uh, Marina, for your comment on the comment. Uh, now, dear audience, you have the chance to ask your questions to Marina Sdzinska and Hanna Hnetkova. You can either post the questions in the chat or speak out loudly here on Zoom. Um, yes, I think Professor Potnov has a question. Um, good evening, good evening, dear colleagues. So, if I may, uh, I have a question also, but a kind of a, I don't know comment or whatever, an introductory remark, if I may. Um, if I may, if not, you just stop me. So, um, I should admit um, I liked uh, the topic of uh, Marina's dissertation very much. Maybe because myself, I've been thinking for some time about actually the influences of French literature on one particular person who is one of my heroes, and he was mentioned so many times tonight, I am very happy about it. I mean, Viktor Petrov Domontovich. Um, and um, before I ask this question, uh, I would like um, to use this opportunity uh, to say some words for people in the audience who have no idea whom are we talking about. Because again, you see, dear colleagues, I am very happy that finally tonight we are uh, trying to talk about Petrov, Zerov, Dreichmara, Filipovich, so people who are usually completely unknown in German or broadly speaking, so-called Western European, whatever context. Ukraine is identified with other people here and much less educated, much less, you know, uh, interested in intellectual debates and so, so on. And that's a great pity. Just imagine, just imagine, dear colleague, just, just imagine Marina, uh, mentioned uh, Yuri Klan, so the guy, the poet, translator, uh, whose real name was actually Oswald Burkhardt, so he was a German by ethnic origin, 
And actually, his German origin helped him to emigrate in 1931 from the Soviet Ukraine to Germany. Yeah. And in Germany, now imagine it again, in five years, he defended a dissertation uh, on literary studies devoted to the Russian writer, Leonid Andreev. So very prominent Russian writer who died before that, yeah, in Finland. And uh, after that, because he was a German and he lived in Germany, of course, as you could imagine, he was called to, to Wehrmacht. So he spent the war as a translator in the German troops. Yeah, and then he died very soon after the war in 1947. So we have such an incredible personality, a person who was really one of the leading Ukrainian uh, and German, if I may, intellectuals and, and whatsoever, completely unknown nowadays here. Or imagine the personality of Viktor Petrov once again. So a person who was raised in the family of a high-ranked Orthodox priest, yeah, um, who became a close friend and collaborator of this neoclassicist group we were talking about. And you've mentioned that, uh, you've noticed that Marina and Hanna, they've quoted Viktor Platonovich many, many times, his notes, his memoirs, stuff like that. Again, completely unknown, not translated into German absolutely unknown, non-present at all. And now think about it. So this person, he became right before the Second World War started, he became the director of the Institute for Ukrainian Ethnography in Kyiv, yeah? And he was of course evacuated uh, to Ufa, so present day Bashkortostan in Russia. And then he was asked by the Soviet authorities to help them during the war as a Soviet agent. So he returned to Ukraine. He appeared in the Nazi occupied, National Socialist occupied Ukraine, the German occupied Ukraine, first in Kharkiv, then later on, he edited a journal published in these occupied territories. Then he spent some, times, uh, some time in immigration in uh, München, uh, Munich and other cities in Western Germany. And then after this very long adventure, he was still kind of evacuated, yeah, or taken back to Soviet Union. So he's one of a very few Soviet, um, let's say, uh, let's put it this way, one of a few great intellectuals and Soviet agents who survived this evacuation. So then he was like, he was allowed to return to Kyiv and to continue his research as an ar archeologist, yeah, in 1960s. So just imagine such a biography. So someone who was on the one hand, like who was still like part of the pre-revolutionary Russian culture, who then became very active in this Ukrainian neoclassicist movement, then Soviet scholar, then uh, Ukrainian emigre scholar, yeah, who worked also, as, as I've said, for the Soviet uh, secret service. Uh, and then again, Soviet archeologist, and it's, it's only one person. And he was also a writer, and he was also a philosopher, and he was also a historian. It's unbelievable, and nobody is interested about it. That, that's really pity. And my big hope is that Ukrainian studies will finally, I mean, in Germany or in France or whatever, they will finally include also such people, and not just you know guys on on the, you know, I'm not going to give their names once again because everybody talks on them too much. Now, uh, dear colleagues, imagine something else. We are talking about Soviet Ukraine, yeah. Uh, mostly actually not Soviet Kharkiv, so the capital of the Soviet Kharkiv, but about Kyiv. So the center of this neoclassicist movement is Kyiv, so the old capital, yeah? It's 1920s, it's post revolutionary era. I think uh, Marina made a great point that we should be aware, we should have this context that in French case, it is the aftermath of the French Revolution, 1848. In Ukrainian case, it's the aftermath of the revolutions and civil wars of 1917-1921. And we have this Kyiv, yeah, which is on the one hand, uh, has this experience of revolutions. Yeah, you have Polish troops there, you have all possible, you have German troops there, yeah, in 1918 and so, so on. On the other hand, it's mostly Russian speaking city. It's a city of mostly Russian culture. Actually, let me tell that also, I, I'm, I'm, I'm absolutely sure about Zerov and Petrov, at least was one of my question actually, that they were Russian speaking people in their private lives, okay? But as the writers, as the intellectuals, they were Ukrainian speaking. They've tried to create this new Ukrainian literature and try to move, as Han rightly said, like Ad Fontes, moving back to the sources, so make another, a proper and a deeper translation of ancient literary tradition. Yeah, not to form this Kotlerevsky past, but to do it properly, classically. Um, and they're doing this entire, let's say, project in a situation of extreme 
pressure from the Soviet government, yeah, from all those ideas of socialist realism, yeah, literature should serve the people, and so, so, so on. And of course, as you could imagine, their personal stories, they're pretty tragic. They were all arrested. Uh, some of them were released, like Maxim Rilski, uh, but the price for his freedom was very high, yeah, so he has to, like, stop being a neoclassicist, but becoming some, someone else, a Soviet Ukrainian writer, yeah. Uh, Petrov was also arrested and spent some time in jail, and uh, some people like Mikola Zerov, yeah, or Mohamed Drekhmarov, they, like, let's say, they never escaped uh, physical destruction by the Soviet state. So we're talking about something really incredible, really unusual, really fascinating. And also we're talking about a project that opposed the dominant populist, Narodnitska, yeah, whatever we call it, uh, Ukrainian tradition, based on this idea that Ukraine means village, yeah, means people's culture. Because think about it again, all of them, Zerov, Klan, Petrov, Filipovich, they were trying to create a new, modern, urban, Western-oriented Ukrainian culture. It's something really unbelievable. It. And um, so I would, I would really like invite all of us to, to feel, to feel the magnitude uh, of this story and the um, I would say the intellectual um, scope of those people who we're talking about and who, in my mind, we should deeply respect. Okay, and now two questions very briefly, if I may. So first of all, uh, Marina, please uh, explain it to me. Maybe you know it because I, I, it's just my intuition, maybe I'm wrong. So my feeling, at least about Petrov, yeah, is that um, his knowledge of French literature, both poetry and prose. So he himself wrote prose. Okay, so that's mostly about prose, of course. And if you're talking about prose, uh, I would say that there were two most important um, sources. One, uh, Henri de Renier, another one, Anatole France. So my impression is that Petrov read both of them in Russian. Uh, and even though he could read French, it seems like from his, you know, other publications, but in this case, it was mostly through the Russian translation. So maybe accidentally, you know, am I right or not? Uh, maybe it was not like that. And what about like the, the other, the poets? Uh, was it always like a direct contact to the French literature? Or was it somehow through Russian uh, translations? I am very curious about it. Uh, maybe accidentally you could yeah, you could, uh, yeah, write uh, clear somehow. I would be very grateful for that. And um, uh, actually, maybe I'll stop at this point. I think this question would be enough like, for the beginning. Thank you so much indeed for this talk and for the comment. Uh, thank you so much for such a great introduction of the um, neoclassics uh, to our auditory uh, about your questions. Um, actually, I don't know, um, but I, I will think about it. And when I will work with the translations um, of Parnassian uh, poetry, uh, I will compare the Russian variants uh, which were existed at the time and the French variants. About Petrov, um, uh, it's also I'm planning to work uh, with his prose uh, in connection with the French literature. Mm, uh, it will be in mm, a little bit, a little bit lately, uh, but I will also <laughs> uh, think uh, about um, the um, uh, texts uh, which uh, he was reading Russian or uh, French. Thank you. Um, thank you. We have gotten quite a lot of questions in, in at our chat box, and the first one is by Elzbieta Kwiecinska, and she writes: "Very interesting research. Congratulations. Interconnectedness of Ukrainian literature with France looks very appealing and shows a truly transnational character of Ukrainian culture. I would also incorporate an approach that shows interconnectedness into your narrative." So instead of showing French element as a proof of Ukrainian belonging to Europe, I would focus on what was transfer and what was not and why. Uh, you want to yeah, comment to it straight away? I guess it makes more sense, right? And then we'll deal with the other questions later. Mm, 
I want to thank you for this uh, comment so much. Um, so I, I will think about, about it. Okay, meanwhile, um, there's also, an, and it's just a comment, I guess uh, you don't need to um, uh, comment on uh, Alexander Kratuchwil's um, comment, and he writes, there's a German translation uh, about Yuri Klien, and it was written by Jutta Lindekugel, and it's published at Kassel University Press in 2003. Only it's not translation, it's the dissertation, yeah? Ah, excuse me, yeah. sorry. Uh, I, I should comment. Uh, thank you. I didn't know about it, and uh, it would be interesting to read uh, how um, German uh, literary uh, critics um, uh, shows the Yuri Kuen. Okay, um, I guess we can move to the next question now and then go back as you wish. Or also, if Hanna, you want to like to add, you would like to add something, you're also very welcome to do that. Um, yeah, Marina, what's your preference? I think we should go to the another question. It's it's a real question, as I see. Okay, Sh should I read it out? Okay, I'm not sure how completely Theophile Gautier could be put in the Parnassian category, but the idea of l'art pour l'art, so the art for the art's sake, was formulated in the introduction to Gautier's novel Mademoiselle Maupin, written in 1835. Uh, 35, yeah. The novel which thematizes the topic of homosexuality, the probably most read today work of Gautier is the club of hashish users, etc. etc. I wonder how relevant such scandalous, or if you wish, not necessarily associated with something classical topics were for Ukrainian neoclassicists. Mm. Thank you for your comment. Um, Teofil Gautier uh, is really a controversial person for. Uh, Parnassism, but uh, his uh, Amor Ekame um, is uh, really um, a Parnassian um, collection of works. Um, uh, I like uh, the novel Mademoiselle uh, de Maupin um, and uh, uh, the uh, homosexual topic is uh, in the um, already mentioned uh, Victor Petrov's uh, novel, uh, which is called Dr. Seraphicus. Um, and I'm also planning uh, to, um, in some way, to compare these uh, uh, two works uh, um, because uh, one um, motive is um, um, uh, is in these uh, two works uh, uh, in the same way, uh, and uh, I will write um, uh, a part of um, uh, research about it. Okay, thank you. Um, so since there is another question, uh, again, another comment by Alexander Kratuchwil, and he uh, once again thanks you for the interesting talk, and he writes, uh, do you know the new novel by Sofia Androkovic? There is a nearly 200 pages essay on Petrov and Serov. If you have read it, what do you think about it? Uh, thank you so much. Uh, I know about this novel, but I haven't read it yet. Um, maybe if someone else uh, had read, um, please share your ideas. <laughs> it would be interesting. Um, I also haven't read it yet <laughs> because uh, I'm living in Vienna and I couldn't get the, uh, the original. Um, I wanted to uh, tell you that 
um, it's pretty certain that um, me and uh, one more translator are going to translate uh, Dumontovich in, into German. So maybe it's going to be like uh, a good news for you. <laughs> and uh, I wanted to um, uh, return to the first question, like uh, to the first comment, because uh, I don't quite understand uh, about this uh, interconnectedness. Uh, does it correspond with, with my uh, advice of uh, uh, taking uh, different Ukrainian translations, or what? What does it? Um, what does it suggest uh, for the uh, work of Marina? Uh, dear colleagues, I, I'm actually I'm I'm sorry for like interrupting, but I think it we're like talking to uh, each other, sharing different views, which is great. So I, I think it would be nice if Elisabetta would like join us and explain it. But while she's doing it, let me then respond to Alexander's question. If it's you know it's like really to like to all of us. So uh, you see, dear Alexander, accidentally uh, Sofia Androkovich, uh, she even asked me to read uh, this part of her novel before it was published. So I was kind of lucky to be the first reader of it, or one of the first readers maybe. Yeah, and I should tell that uh, she did a serious research. So this text is based on a careful reading of uh, letters that Viktor Petrov sent to Sofia Zerov. Okay, let me explain maybe something more, dear colleagues, for those of you. So you remember the names Zerov, uh, Petrov. So they were friends uh, in uh, Kyiv in 1920s. And at some point, uh, Petrov uh, fell in love with Zerov's wife. Okay, so it's a pretty complicated story. And it was not just just a kind of an affair, it was a lifetime story. So uh, it began in 1920s and it uh, continued till Petrov's death. So he finally married Sofia many, many years afterwards uh, in uh, post-war Soviet Kyiv. So imagine it, yeah, it's like the story of, you know, uh, decades. Now, we have those letters, they are preserved in Kyiv, so Sofia Zerova preserved those letters. They're mostly, now attention, they're mostly letters sent from Moscow, where Petrov was kept when he was taken from Munich and not still allowed to go to Kyiv, okay? So it's not like the entire uh, history, it's mostly this Moscow part of it. And uh, Sofia Androkovich uh, proposed uh, her interpretation of uh, this story. Uh, which again, I, I'd like to stress it, which is based on uh, the reading of this stuff. But what I'd like to recommend using this opportunity, what I'd like to recommend those of you who are really interested in it. So we have this uh, Sofia Androkovich novel, and we will have very soon, in a couple of months, a full publication of all the letters sent by Petrov to Sofia from Moscow. It was done by my great colleague, Victoria Sergienko. I wrote a foreword. So just wait a couple of months, it will be published completely. So all the letters and everybody then could make his or her own opinion, whether Sophia is correct in quoting them, whether not, why, so and so, so. So I'm very happy about this publication. I should also tell you probably if you're interested that the absolute majority of those letters are in Russian. Okay, so that was the language of their personal private communication. Um, uh, they are in Russian. And um, yeah, that's actually, again, an interesting point, maybe for Marina, I don't, I'm not sure here, but for me, it's very interesting to think about it, that you have uh, writers, yeah, or scholars, who were, uh, once again, who were Russian speaking in their everyday life, or mostly Russian speaking, yeah, but who consciously choose Ukrainian as the language of their texts, poetry texts, literary texts. For instance, Petrov, as a writer, he wrote in Ukrainian, yeah, so he has also Russian language um, scientific publications, but not the literary stuff, just a few of them, not relevant. Uh, and. I feel that in this case, this language choice is also of, uh, of relevance. And you remember Marina said that 
uh, this national aspect. It is different in French and Ukrainian case. And of course it's different because you know, in French, uh, as we know, uh, especially in the mid 19th century, the issue of uh, language unification is more or less solved, more or less solved. Yeah, it's French speaking country, so to say. Uh, in the case of Soviet Ukraine, it's not at all solved. Furthermore, we are talking exactly about the time period when the Soviet government started this politics of indigenization or Koreanization or Ukrainization, yeah? And I mean, so the uh, project of promoting Ukrainian language as the language of our Soviet Ukrainian motherland. And there's also an interesting, you know, aspect here. So uh, I think we should be all the time aware that for all those people, it was really like a functioning in uh, intellectual and social bilingual uh, situation, plus, plus their perfect knowledge of several, let's say, Western languages. Because as for Petrov, it was German first and foremost, he was fluent in German. For Klein, it was apparently German. Uh, for Zarev, it was also, yeah, a set of old languages, yes, so Latin, Greek, and so, so on. And uh, this language diversity, I think, uh, played a very important role here. It was a very important part of the story. For Rilski, it was actually Polish, because don't forget that Maxim Rilski, he was, uh, like a, his family story is a story of a Polish nobility, okay? So he was born in a, in a family of Polish noble who consciously decided to become a Ukrainian, and so, so on. So we have all this complexity and, um, I think it's it's great. It's just a real challenge for any scholar to look into it and to analyze it properly. And of course, Hannah, you've, I'm so happy that you are translating Viktor Platonovich in German. Great. Thank you so much for that. Yeah, thank you, Professor Portnov, for another comment uh, from your side. Um, I would now invite the rest of the audience or Marino or Hanna to make additional comments. Um, we can also get back to Elgibieta's uh, comment she posted a couple of minutes ago. Um, yeah. Perhaps Alexander, or you want to uh, uh, share your take on the Andrukovic uh, novel? Okay, sorry. Took a, a while <laughs> to uh, to switch on the uh, audio. Um, no, I, I'm just reading the novel. I and I, I just started now to read that part um, uh, about Zerov and and Petrov. So and I, thank you very much, uh, Andre, for this uh, background information, um, which is very helpful in a way to uh, estimate or to to uh, um, contextualize what Sophia uh, wrote. So it's a very interesting novel, but it's totally um, something different. It's not about a, a topic today, so yeah. Okay. And Adam, I actually also wanted to ask Hanna, which novel of Domontovich uh, Petrova are you translating? Um, if it's not yeah. a secret. <laughs> I hope it's <laughs> I hope it's okay even uh, if I say it, uh, but yeah um, it's gonna be Divchinka's uh, uh the girl with the teddy bear, um, and uh, I hope uh, that it's gonna work with the um, Septima flag uh, in Vienna. Uh, we've already signed the agreement and we are waiting for the response of uh, House of Europe um, Foundation, yeah. Um, and as for uh, Amadoka, as for the novel of uh, Sofia Androkhovic, I think it's like the um, 
secondary um, Romanized biography. We, we know that Domantovich has uh, written many uh, biographies of uh, um, Kulish and uh, Kostomarov, and uh, Sofia is like uh, uh, responding to it with a biography of Domantovich himself. <laughs> it's a pretty interesting um, um, point of uh, view on, on Domantovich. <laughs> Yeah, thank you, Hannah. Um, let's uh, uh, in uh, great anticipation wait for uh, this uh, very interesting uh, translation um, into German. Yeah. Um, so, is there anyone else who would like to share something, make some comment? Uh, Marina, Han Hannah, uh, Andri. Um, I don't know, if, perhaps, I don't know, Marina, do you want to share your contact date if someone wants to, uh, if someone has a thought afterwards so they can contact you, I don't know. Um, we will, uh, anyhow, we will send you uh, the chat script so you can go through all these comments and questions after the talk. Um, yeah, so it, it will it will be kept for reference for you. Um. Yeah, I'm finishing the article about um, uh, this topic which uh, I presented, and maybe it uh, will not be finished uh, um, soon uh, because I want to add some um, translation uh, research uh, to it. Uh, but lately, if someone wants, I uh, will happy to share this. And uh, I wanted to thank you for this uh, possibility uh, for such format, uh, which uh, maybe is impossible in the um, offline uh, life, in offline conferences, um, that uh, we um, spend so much time uh, for, for the one topic. Um, and uh, for me, it was very useful. Uh, and I get uh, some things to think about. And uh, really, thank you for it. Yeah, if, if, uh, yeah I'm, 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 you can hear me, right? Yeah, if, if, thank you, Marina. Also, uh, sort of from the from the side of the organizer, it was really a pleasure uh, to have you here, uh, both Marina and uh, Hannah. Um, it's, of course, very sad that uh, it's not in person, but I hope that uh, someday uh, there will be the possibility to meet in person in Frankfurt or Berlin or whatever. Um, yeah, but it's also, a, of course, a great possibility, this whole corona uh, thing to hold such, um, such formats. And it's very likely that actually the online colloquium will be extended uh, to the next semester. But you will be informed about this in due time. Yeah, I hope, uh, I, I don't know, we can finish or if there is some uh, more comments from your side, we would be very happy to include these. Any last uh, thoughts, any last, uh, um, Anyone has a need to talk, to share something? Uh, now is your moment. Um, but if not, um, then I guess uh, we have to greatly thank you all for attending, uh, dear audience. And we would, we are, I think we are very much uh, thankful to Marina and Hannah who have agreed to um, share their work with us and to deliver such interesting uh, talks tonight is part of our colloquium. So have a good evening and um, a good rest and hope to see you next week um, at the same time at 6 p.m. Um, where we will have a 
talk by Oleksandr Avramchuk, um, moderated by Bojena Kozakevich. It's the same Zoom link, uh, the same time here on Zoom. Yeah, have a good evening and see you next week. Thank you all for attending. Bye bye. Thank you.